Hi, hey, welcome to another conversion story. Today we will be discussing Terry's journey into the Catholic Church, and as usual, uh, we'll have her start at the very beginning of her journey in childhood and talk about uh, her religious influences and um, eventually get her into the Catholic Church where she is today and maybe talk about uh, her interest in the lay Dominicans. She's been in that for quite a while. So with that, Terry, welcome. Thank you, Corey. And uh, yeah, uh, just yeah, start at the beginning and uh, share a little bit uh, about your journey with us. Okay, well, the beginning was in 1951 when I was born to Joseph, who is Catholic, and Amelia, who is Lutheran. My father gave my mother whatever she wanted except for one thing and that is he said if they were to get married his children would be raised catholic and she agreed so i was baptized into the catholic church i made my first communion at seven and my uh confirmation at nine we were in just an ordinary catholic family not particularly devout mass every sunday confession monthly um prayers at meals and bedtime, but that was pretty much it. Weren't really involved in the church outside of just Sunday and and going to confession. Um, I loved the church. I loved the mass. I used to beg my father to take us to high mass, and he never wanted to go to actual high mass because it took too long. But um, I did I did love the church. However, being born in 51, um, I was in my mid-teens when oh, everything broke loose. Vatican Council, all the social upheavals of the 60s. And as a result, I got swept up in all of that. I stopped going to church regularly. I would go every once in a while. I still loved the Mass, but then the Novus Ordo came, and that was the final break, the last tie, because I didn't like the new Mass at all. Well, and if you don't mind, uh, what sort of things did you not like about it? I, I, it was, it was simplified to the point of, um, just being plain and ordinary and I, I just I didn't have any words or um, concepts just I missed the beauty I missed mm. the processions I missed the incense I missed the um, the music I definitely didn't like the new music um, but in a sense it didn't seem sacred to you anymore exactly Exactly. Though I would never have put it in those words at that time. It just wasn't, it just wasn't what I wanted. And so I left. And I pretty much just abandoned the faith um, completely, almost completely. I never became an actual atheist. I was more of a deist. Believed that there was a God didn't think he much particularly had much to do with my life hmm. and I lived that late 60s early 70s wild lifestyle I um, I've always been a reader and um, I always like to study I always wanted to learn things and so I kept on reading, and New Age came out, and I read a lot about the New Age. Mm -hmm. I read a lot about Eastern religions. I've since realized that what I was reading was pretty inaccurate as far as things like Hinduism and Buddhism goes. I was reading the, the U.S. hippie versions, you know. Um, but they didn't they didn't answer anything for me I enjoyed math and science I particularly liked reading about physics and astronomy 
But that was all, and I always knew that that's only about the material world. It doesn't, science does not address anything that's supernatural. Doesn't have anything to do with it. Right, it's just empirical. It's only testing exactly. things that can be observed. Yes, exactly. And that I was always aware of. I never lost that knowledge. But I didn't so I but I didn't ha find anything that attracted me or drew me in. Not in science, not in politics, not in new age, not in eastern religions, nothing. And so I just continued to live a very secular lifestyle. I eventually married into a Unitarian Universalist church, or family. They were involved in the Unitarian Universalist church, and they were um, lovely people. But it, it just seemed to me that it was just a bunch of people who were just grabbing at whatever passed them in the stream I mean, I met a Jewish Buddhist. Um, they had a, a, a Wiccan, a lesbian Wiccan was the minister at one time. Um, an atheist, an open atheist was the minister at one time. It, it, it just seemed to me to be a catch as catch can. And there was nothing in there for me. And so I just continued with my secular lifestyle. So the only dogma they had was is that there is no dogma. Right. Yeah. Well, there... And one other. And one other. You can be anything you want and believe anything you want, but you best not be a Christian. Huh. Yeah, those uh, pesky Christians, so... Right, yeah. right. Can't allow that. <laughs> exactly. So, so I, I just, I continued on. But it, it was um, an empty thing. There was no, no, nothing of substance in my life. I continued reading, reading on lots of different topics and and learning what I could learn just in bits and pieces of all kinds of different subjects. But there really wasn't anything solid. And as I got into my later 20s, mid to late 20s, I started feeling like I was being followed. Not a, not a paranoid kind of thing, but it's like, there was somebody there and every time I turned around there was somebody there not hallucinating not, but I just had this weird feeling and um, one day I was reading through I had picked up at the bookstore I had picked up a anthology of poetry from I don't know, they started, I think there was some Greek poetry in it, and it went right on up to modern day. Are you going to start quoting me the Hound of Heaven now? I'm not going to quote it, but I was going to bring it up. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I read that and thought, oh, I know exactly what he's talking about. Yes. I know exactly what he's talking about. This is what I've been feeling. Well... I thought about it. I can't say I prayed about it, but I thought about it. And so I went to my local, where I was living, I went to the local parish and started going to Mass there. I even went to confession. And, um, but I wasn't getting what I needed. Still didn't care for the new Mass. Um, and just going in and sitting in the pew. And I didn't know how to go about getting anything else. Now, you know? now when you say that you weren't getting what you needed, how did you really conceptualize I, I, need at that point? I needed spiritual direction. I didn't know the words for it. 
but that's what I needed. Mm. I needed spiritual direction. I needed um, people around to talk to and and to mentor me. Um, and I didn't know how to go about that. How, how to go about getting that in the Catholic Church? My my childhood was you go to church, you go to church, you go to confession. You know that's that was that was the depth of it. Um, though I can't say that my father's faith was not strong, it was, but it was a very childlike faith. Um, this is just the way it is, and. Um, so uh, the, we belong to, uh, my husband and I belong to a food co-op. And the people who ran the food co-op were evangelical Christians. And one of them suggested to me a church to go to. And it was a very large, um, actually it was an Assemblies of God. And it was quite large church in Saginaw. And I went. I went twice. The week in between the first two times I went, I had nightmares every night. I had nightmares the, the entire week, every night, following the second Sunday that I went. Not necessarily anything having to do with the church. I don't even remember what the nightmares were, just waking up that it was nightmares. And um, so I, I decided I wasn't going back there. Obviously, that was not the place for me so once again I was just sort of on my own and not sure where I wanted to go or what I wanted to do and I ran into a woman I'd gone, gone to high school with and she had become a born again Christian and was very happy with the little church that she was a part of and she invited me to go and yeah. I went and it was unlike anything I'd ever been to before but it was almost entirely 20-somethings. Some married, some not. The married ones all had little kids. I was pregnant with my second child. And I just felt like, okay, this is where I belong. And I stayed there for about 18 years. Um, I got very involved. I taught Bible studies. I uh, was um, I was actually became an elder and uh, just really really involved and and for quite some time I was was pretty happy being there. Now was this like a non-denominational or yeah, non-denominational? The 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 biggest it ever got was like seventy people. Okay. It was small. Most of the time it was less than, and that was including counting all the children. And so it was. It was. Um, it was a intimate kind of little place. Everybody knew everybody. Everybody was involved in everybody's life, and um, lots and lots of talk about the Lord. Lots and lots of Bible studies, prayer groups. You know, very involved in really, truly what I needed at that time. And I, I believe that that is where I was supposed to be then. I don't have any any question in that. But there's no, no, um, there's, there's no hierarchy, there's no authority, there's no anything. And people just go along as, as uh, they think best at the time and somebody invited um, a gentleman to come and begin a Bible program and he did certificates and it was all but it was all just this one man and he would come every Tuesday and it was a three-year program and he taught his interpretation of scripture and some of it was just outright heresy did you have an example of uh, some crazy oh, stuff okay. that he was teaching? Okay. Yeah. Uh, God does not know what's going to happen in the future. Oh, yeah, that uh, view of time. Yes, yes. 
You know, what's interesting is I think uh, w uh, William Lane Craig has that kind of idea that uh, God steps into time. And uh, so there isn't kind of a a temporal, you know, God who's outside of time. He steps into time and he's just working things out. Or um, the the open theists, they had this conception that the, the only the present is actual. And so the the future is a state of becoming. And so God knows everything, but he only knows that which is knowable, which would be that which is actual. And it gets, God's knowledge gets redefined and stuff like that. Was he, was he influenced by either of those kinds of... He may have been influenced, but that is not really what he taught. He taught God doesn't know. He is not omnipotent. I mean, uh, um, 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 Omniscient. He is not omniscient. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, and there were a lot of there were there were that was that was the biggest one, um, the biggest shock to me when he started on that one. But he was also very much. Um, uh, I am the only one who knows the truth. Mm. That kind of that kind of an attitude. He 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 really disliked Catholics. He really disliked Wesleyans. He really disliked Methodists. He you know anybody with any any kind of a um, theological system that wasn't his. Uh, he, he openly said he was teaching a theological system and it was the only one that was the true one according to the word of God you know what's interesting is a, a, uh, I had a similar experience when I was in my 20s got invited to this uh, house church and it was I don't know what denomination this pastor was part of but he had left and he basically threw out all his commentaries uh, all of his theological texts that he used for training himself over the years and he was just going to take a literalistic reading of scripture so God couldn't see through clouds he has to come down to see to find out what's going on basically all of the Old Testament anthropomorphisms were taken literally as God revealing exactly what, what constitutes his nature. And uh, uh, yeah, that was the craziest thing I'd ever yeah. saw. I felt so bad for the guy and there was no way of getting to him. Yeah, Bob was, Bob was pretty much there. Um, yeah, um, very much so. Uh, it caused um, a church split. Uh, actually, it was the second split. There had been a split prior to that. And then to cause a church split over this, um, dear friends of mine left. I stuck it out. I thought, okay, this is not open-ended. He's leaving. He's, not, he's only going to be here, you know. He's here once a week for three years. The three years are almost up. Um... Let's see what happens when he goes. And things pretty much loosened up a little bit um, after he was gone. There were still some who were very adamant uh, that he was the way things should always be. But most of the people sort of backed off. But one thing going to his classes did for me, because he would say something and I would go, what? And I'd go home and I'd look, I'd study it. I would take it apart. I would look through different, you know, I would just question what he said. And when he left, I continued questioning. And there were a lot of things that I noticed that I hadn't really noticed before. I started noticing 
the places in scripture that are never preached on in a little evangelical church. The 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 play the the, the passages that are skipped over. You read it reading the, the ministers reading a chapter um, of scripture and skips a verse. Okay, why would you do that? Well, because he doesn't want to explain why Peter says baptism now saves you. Okay, um, it was purely um, just something you did out of obedience. It didn't actually do anything. So he doesn't want to explain why Peter says baptism now saves you. If you don't mind, uh, if I can interject a quick story that uh, sure. uh, is very similar to this. It's not my story. Uh, a friend of mine who also became Catholic from the Church of Nazarene, he was at Nazarene Bible College, and uh, absolutely loved this particular professor that he was talking to, but he was in a New Testament course on the Gospels. And the professor had a master's and a doctorate from Leiden, and a uh, New Testament, like completely just focused on the New Testament. And there was a conversation that took place. I don't remember what it was. Maybe it was about forgiveness or, um, you know, uh, the confession or something. But uh, my friend had quoted, you know, that, you know, the sins that you forgive are forgiven. Those that are retained are retained. And he says, the Bible says nothing like that. And, yes. that, and then he tells the, the professor to read out loud such and such verse. And he's like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And that was one of them. That was one of the verses that you'd never hear about. John chapter six, never hear about that. Um, none of those. Um, um Paul, First Corinthians, the the um, what is lacking, you know, what is lacking in the sacrifice of Christ. Never talk about those things. Never ever. Um, prior to the this teacher coming, the church had been the the church that I was going to was very much involved in the Jewish roots of Christianity. Um. That was that was a big part of it. Very Zionistic, you know. Sang a lot of songs that had a Jewish kind of flavor to them. Put put some Hebrew words here and there in the songs, and did some dancing and that kind of thing. Um, Are you still at the same church? I'm still. It's still the same church. It's, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they they started doing that. They had, they had actually done that before Bob. Bob was very anti-Semitic. So that kind of went away a little bit, um, but came back, roaring back when he left, um, when his, his three years was up. But in that time, I started becoming close with a co-worker who was Jewish, and she was non-practicing. But she wanted to start getting back into her Jewish faith. So one day she invited me to go with her to a um, Jewish history class taught by the local rabbi. And I said, sure, I'm always up for learning new things. So we went. We end, I ended up taking two more courses from him, Hebrew, for two years from him. But somewhere along the line, she wanted to start going to Sabbath services. And she was real nervous about it, so she asked me to go with her. And we worked nights. So one Friday night, we brought, we came in and we, we always worked, we worked in scrubs because we worked in, in labor delivery, OB. And so we brought in clothes to wear to, to the synagogue the next morning and finished work, got dressed, went over to the synagogue. And we walked in and they handed everybody this book. 
and the book had Hebrew on one side and English on the other. And I laughed and I said, oh, this looks like my old missile. My old missile had Latin on one side and English on the other. And I thought, oh, that's that's funny. And so we went in and here comes the, the service starts and the rabbi comes out and he's in vestments and he's carrying the scrolls and they process in and it was a very liturgical service you know it was they, you know with the the rabbi praying and the people doing re responding and everybody's following along in their book and i'm sitting there thinking why am i in a catholic service it was it was like the old catholic it was there was so much similarity and i just it just puzzled me i could not figure it out it took years it took years for me to realize because the apostles were jewish and when they started having services outside of the synagogue they followed the same pattern this was how you worship they didn't consider themselves to no longer be jewish and it, but it took me years to to figure that one out but it was a little break in the i'm not a catholic anymore attitude that i had and that was the first real break in that over the years there were other things that happened that put even more little breaks even more little breaks one day I was home from work um, and I was tired or wasn't feeling well or something so I was just sitting on the couch searching through the television and surfing through and I came across this young person in a whole crowd of young people and this young person was being interviewed by a reporter and the young person was just talking about Jesus and so excited and so and there were all these young people around that were so excited and so you know happy and I couldn't you know watch this for a couple of hours before I figured out that it was World Youth Day in Denver with John Paul II and I thought wow this is interesting and so I made note of the channel and I started watching EWTN on a regular basis. I particularly liked Journey Home because lots of questions that I had were being answered and I was getting lots of um, suggestions for books to read like Rome Sweet Home and by what authority and you know so um those kinds of things sure for those who don't know room street home was written by scott hahn and yes. uh, by what authority by mark shea is that correct is that one by mark shea or is that i don't remember anymore i read a bunch of mark shea's books i read um tim uh tim gray oh, no. gray maybe maybe there was there was one in evangelical finds uh, catholic tradition authority no evangelical finds yeah i don't remember but yeah oh, tim, but, staples. Uh, tim staples tim staples tim staples yes. oh, okay thanks nick that's thanks for the suggestion so I was reading, I began reading all these books, and it just was making so much sense to me. One day, the pastor, I'm still in this little church, and one day the pastor said, um, I'm going to be away for the weekend, will you take the service? 
said, okay, sure. So I thought, what am I going to, what am I going to preach on? And I thought, okay, um, I'm, I'm reading the Gospel of John right now. That's where I'm studying right now is the Gospel of John. How about the high priestly prayer? And so that's what I decided to prepare to preach on. And I got so convicted. Like, why are you not back in the church? That was, that was Jesus' last request of his father. We would be one. And one visibly, not not some invisible church, but one so visible that the world would believe. Mm. Yeah, it had a purpose to it. Yeah. Right. And and um, so I started looking for um, started looking for a church, and uh, I went to a lot of different. First, I started with the one that that I was raised in, the parish I was raised in, because that's where my parents were still going. And I thought, well, they'll be happy to have me back. And I went in and went, yeah, no. <laughs> no. If I want swaying and clapping and hand raising and that kind of stuff, I'll stay where I am. I want a Catholic church. You know, I want something that's at least similar to what I grew up with. And I did finally find one. And I began going there for daily mass because it was right on my way home from work at where I was working at the time. So how old were you um, at this time? Oh, 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 by this time, in my 40s. All right, you're in your 40s. You started uh, attending uh, Catholic mass on a daily basis. On daily, the daily mass, but still going to the little evangelical church on Sundays. And then finally I said, no, no, I went, made an appointment with my pastor and said, I'm, I'm leaving, I'm leaving. And he said, okay, can you tell me what it is, why you're going? And so I started telling him and I got to the, the verse, um, what is lacking in the sacrifice of Christ and asked him what he thought it meant and he really fluttered around a little bit and couldn't really say anything he says well here's what the catholic church says and he said i don't want to know i don't want to hear it. i said okay and uh and that was it i was back at the church you know i i often find it odd because for me uh, growing up as uh, growing as a Christian I had a lot of interest in how different passages could be variously interpreted yeah. and I, particularly because um, if I were to find certain interpretations more convincing than others how do I know I have yet heard the most convincing demonstration of how to understand that passage yes and having that just general openness even if i you know i find fault with the interpretation and i have plenty of reasons why um it would be odd to me to be closed off to potential truth yes yes and that that's me the idea i don't want to know is so foreign to me and that's about anything that's about anything if somebody says to me um who's the guy who starred in that one movie i gotta find out i, I can't <laughs> i want to know <laughs> mm -hmm. so 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 even something as simple as that but something as as important as truth to say I don't want to know was just astounding to me. I didn't, I, I just didn't get it. But I was back in the church, and 
I was happy. I was really, really happy. It was a very long time. I mean, maybe a couple of years when I didn't break down in tears when the priest would lift up the host and say, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Happy are those called to the supper of the Lamb. It's like, called, I'm called. I didn't, you know, it was just, it was just, you know, tears. It took a very long time to, you know, that, that before that became something that didn't make me just bust into tears hearing. Um, I was very, very happy being back at the church. I wasn't always happy with everything I saw going on. But I was happy to be back. Now, at this point, um, while you're attending daily mass, these were the, this was the Norv, uh, the, the Novus Ordo mass. Yeah, yeah there um, was no, yeah, there was no from from the moment the Novus Ordo came out until what a year and a half ago, there was there were no there was no mass in the Sagno Diocese at all. At least masses that were in direct union with the uh, the right. bishop right there was um, there was a um, church called infinite Prague that had masses in it, but I I don't know if they were SSPX or they are they are okay um, there is also a Sadie Vacantist uh, group out in Freeland I I, 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 uh, I found out I think I went past their church one time out seeing because I'm a I'm a hospice nurse, and driving out to a patient's house, I think I went past that church. Yeah, I forget the name of it. It's a very small chapel, a white building just off yep. off the road. Yeah, yep. I, I, I went there for Mass once. Um, the The priest wasn't there, and uh, just a few people were there doing prayers. But I remember talking to one of the gentlemen out, uh, after uh, the hour of prayer and his they, they, oh man, I guess uh, he said that the, the priest was in association with other priests. Um, I forget what the Sede Vacantist uh, group is, but uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I never went back though. But yeah, I, I learned, I learned that there. But um, so, um, as soon as the new mass came out, like, how did you find out? Who told you? Um, how did you end up at the at the Latin mass? Oh, um, I know I'm kind of I, jumping I, ahead. I, I don't mean to. Oh no, that's okay. There had been a meeting a few years before. I think Bishop. I can't remember now if it was Bishop Carlson or Bishop Sistone was bishop at the time. But there had been a group, the Sagno Latin Mass Association had been around for a very long time. But these were people who were driving to Flint, driving to Detroit um, to, to attend Latin Mass. Um, but there was a Sagno Latin Mass Association that was working on it. They had been working on it um, quite a bit and they had um they had a meeting that I'm not sure who told me about somebody told me about it and so I um, it was a dinner uh, at, and um, in Saginaw they had a dinner and they had speakers and and so I bought tickets and went and um, it was quite it was quite interesting and they were working on um, getting trying to get the Latin mass going um, and oh it was it was it was between it was when Carlson left and Sistone came because they had to start over hmm. <laughs> they had been working on this for since Carlson had come, tried actually, actually had an attorney and were petitioning Rome, and they jumped through all these hoops. And then when Carlson left and Sistone came, they had to start over. Yeah, it's um, discouraging. Yeah, it was. It was. 
so I was, you know, and then, then, uh, so I was in contact with, with this group. I wasn't actually part of it, but I was in contact. I'm not truly, <laughs> I'm not a joiner, which is why, you know, I know that it's God for me to be in the lay Dominicans. Um, the, um, so when the when the Latin Mass they announced that there was going to be Latin Mass, I was absolutely thrilled. Well, actually, you know who I heard it from before it was ever even announced. I heard it from a priest I know, and he told me he told me that Bishop Bruce had announced at um, a meeting of where all the priests met, met with Bishop Bruce and they did a bunch of different business and. and at the end of the meeting, he announced that there will be Latin Mass in the Saginaw Diocese. So it was Groose that was the first bishop in, in this diocese that allowed it? Yes, yes. Oh, okay. Bishop, yeah, Bishop Carlson didn't believe in it, and, and um, um, Bishop Sistone... Um, I guess he didn't want to rock the boat. Didn't want to have anything to do with it. Huh? Yeah, so many, so many priests, um, really still, still are are upset and angry that there's that there's Latin mass. And it doesn't um, isn't that a, a amazing that the mass that the church has done in that form for such a long time should cause anybody any grief or distress at all they're they're there's they're firmly convinced that that everyone who attends the latin mass is a set of a cantist and mm. you cannot tell them otherwise you just you cannot tell them otherwise yeah um, yeah because it's a lot it's just you know what's interesting is uh one uh uh, when Francis came out with the motu proprio, um, which I'm not going to slaughter trying to pronounce it. Do you know how to pronounce it? Custodis Traditionis, or Traditionis Custodis. Yes, thanks. Uh, I'm only going to slaughter it over here. Um, it did seem that one of the main concerns was, A, that uh, we recognize Vatican II as a valid council um, and particularly seeing valid the liturgical reforms um, now while I, I, I think too many changes were done in the liturgy and perhaps not for the best reasons and perhaps could be best well by me described as a kind of a failed experiment in uh, the what they were attempting to do um, I certainly had no problem with Vatican II documents. Um, uh, in fact, it's one of the reasons why I'm not part of the SSPX. I, I don't have any problems with um, the documents properly interpreted and understood when it comes to uh, religious freedom and uh, ecumenism. Um, but yeah, it, I, I noticed that was in that motu proprio and I thought, well, why can't you just get everybody at the Latin Mass to sign this and then just leave us alone and let us do what we want? Yeah, I, I, I yeah, um, uh, I, I agree on the, on the documents. The documents are, I find them. Um, very good I, I i i read them and and i thoroughly enjoyed reading them um i didn't find anything particularly off-putting about them um and, but i did find a lot that the novus ordo and and the the church since then violate um Gregorian chant in a private place. Where do you hear Gregorian chant in in any you know um, any Novus Ordo masses or at least the Novus Ordo masses around here? 
I suppose there might be some places that still have that, but they're, they're pretty few and far between as far as I can see. And not only that, I think that there's a general attitude against it. In fact, the uh, um, since we're online, I'm, I'm not going to name places or anything, but uh, my children uh, go to a Catholic school and parents were complaining about some of the the uh, music selections uh, during you know choir uh, class and, and things like that because it was Gregorian chant, uh, which seems incredibly odd to me because uh, th- you know the official language of the Catholic Church is Latin. All its official documents are still promulgated in Latin, and uh, you know all the. Uh, you know, translations uh, come from that, and that it has such a long history within the church. It, it almost seems that people don't want the Catholic faith to be all that it has been, but almost want to craft a new religion for themselves. Maybe that's saying well, too strongly, but that's what it appears to me when I. Is it? very popular song out there that's sung in a lot of parishes that's called Sing a New Church. Oh, is there? New, yes, New Church. And, and you know, I've I, I found it just horrible. Horrible. And I actually got the choir, the the music director at um, at the parish that I used to belong to to stop playing it simply because I told her, I said, I don't want, you know, this is a terrible song. I personally don't want a new church. I want the church Jesus Christ founded. If I wanted a different church, I could go anywhere and start a new one or find one that suits me. But I want the church that Jesus Christ founded. I don't think that we can make up a new one, especially a better one by singing. You know, what's interesting is I kind of get that the church is living and that the church that is living now, the church militant in our time. And I I, I kind of think the idea was, is how is the church going to express itself to the modern world? And so we're not going to be able to reach them with Gregorian chant or Latin or having an emphasis in the mass on the sacrifice um, and things like that. We need to find new expressions all across the board and and maybe try to use some resourcement uh, method and trying to reach back into uh, the early church, uh, maybe resurrect some old church uh, things that may have been in the mass or may have been part of our expression, um, and try to, you know, b- basically express ourselves here and now instead of expressing th- th- a church in a different age to a different world. I I kind of get that, but I think what has happened is that we've gone beyond. Um, I think the it almost seems like instead of challenging the culture, confronting the culture, uh, we have unfortunately been enculturated uh, by the modern world. And I think in the attempt to try to express ourselves to the modern world, we ended up adopting too much uh, from the modern world. I agree. I agree. I think part of this is when the Second Vatican Council happened and what was going on in the world. You don't want to, when there's a hurricane going on with all kinds of junk sailing around, that's not when you open the windows. You know, I mean, it's St. John the 23rd was the idea was to open the windows and let some fresh air in, right? Well, but when when was this? The 60s were a horrible time to let fresh air in because it wasn't fresh air. It was, it was you know, a hurricane in a junkyard. 
<laughs> um, so yeah, that's that made a that was a, a really bad time. Bad that, time. Though I do I do admit that uh, even when many people in the '60s were pushing for you know a change in the church's teaching on birth control you do have uh, you know Pope Paul, Pope Paul VI with Humana Vitae saying right. no the church teaching doesn't change and uh, I, I think some people were actually surprised uh, when the church when the Catholic Church said a Catholic thing which seems quite odd to me because that's what the catholic church does in its yeah. official capacity it, it reminds me very much of when the question of um a women priests came up and i believe it was uh, you can correct me if i'm wrong I, I don't think it was benedict i think it was uh, john paul ii who said church doesn't have authority to do this that was that was yes that was um uh pope john paul ii and um, if you read that, it meets every criteria for being a um, uh, an irreformable definitive teaching. It, yes, yes, yes. And um, people don't. People will twist themselves into pretzels trying to make it so that it wasn't. Um, mm. But yeah, very much so. Very much so. Um, he he, pretty pretty plainly that this was this was infallible teaching, and um, yes. One uh, one thing that I I find impressive about the Catholic faith is that uh, we actually have the church actually has an authority to do this to to speak definitively on subjects and. Looking back at my Protestant days, and you you dabbled in Protestantism for eighteen years when you, yes. you there was no real locus of authority beyond, um, and, and and in the story you had shared with the church split, people were driven more by a strong personality um, than they were, you know, uh, a legitimate authority that echoes the deposit of faith, you know. Um, right. Uh, the, the one way I've I've heard it ex expressed is that you know the the deposit uh, you know was um, written in scripture it was echoed in the church fathers and it's clarified by the magisterium and actually having that authority throughout history uh, to be able to speak to our culture um, uh, to address certain questions and put those things to rest um and, and i think this has been a big one in recent times not just with uh the question of women priests or with uh, the issue of birth control um but there's a lot of people who basically want to just craft the catholic church in their own image and yes. um we recently uh, had the Pelosi ban from communion right. and I you know people have been talking about it and you, you see people in the news talk about how oh, this is so unkind um, you know that the, the church shouldn't do this or worse the church doesn't teach this uh, a lot of you know yes there is a lot of information that circulates social media because not everybody actually is a quali they don't have to be a qualified expert in like a, uh, a credential kind of way they just have to actually know what they're talking about uh, you know um, Whoopi Goldberg was hysterical yes absolutely hysterical guy you don't that's not your job you don't get to say if she can go to communion that's not your job and it's like uh, yeah, it literally is. <laughs> yeah, I, I heard. Uh, yeah, I heard that, that as well. Yes, yeah. that was that was so funny. But yeah, but you know the whole thing with with authority and hierarchy. I had mentioned that the the church that I the little Protestant church I'd gone to had undergone two splits, and I didn't say anything about the first split. The first split was because got very involved in the covenant groups and I don't know if you know anything about that 
Derek Prince and, um, oh, I can't remember all the names, of, but it started with five independent Protestant pastors in Florida. There had been six in this little town, six independent Protestant pastors, and one of the pastors had an affair with his church secretary, broke up two families, you know, the whole thing. And these other five guys got together and said, how can we prevent this from happening with the rest of us? Someone going off the rails. What we need to do is we need to gather together and be um, uh, accountable to each other. And they began working together and then they began to develop this theology basically of having a covenant and it became very much um, a thing of telling people who they could marry and who they couldn't marry um, if that if you had a uh, if you were wanted to go to school what you could go to school for and what you couldn't go to school for um, very authoritarian but they were trying to build this hierarchy and one of them actually said some people say we're trying to reinvent the wheel like well yeah because you are if you want to have a hierarchy that works <laughs> there's already a church that's got that going you know but <clears throat> yeah it, that was that was uh yeah, when you when you're in these little churches, you can go through some really um, interesting twists because everybody's trying to do what seems right in their own eyes. And I keep telling people that's a quote from Scripture, but it doesn't mean it's a good thing. <laughs> God wasn't saying that was a good thing when in scripture it says that everyone did what was right in their own eyes and that, that wasn't a good thing one of my uh, favorite quotes from uh, Luther near the end of his life he said there are as many theologies as there are heads mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, obviously it's because of his theological method uh, basically gave fruit to that uh, uh, that kind of reality. Yes. Yes. All right, just give me a moment. Um, at this point, if anybody has questions from the chat, uh, anybody has any questions for Terry about her journey, about um, the Catholic Church, please be sure to uh, uh, put that into the chat. Now, we are coming up to an hour, but if you have a little bit more time, um, I would like to ask about how you got interested in the lay Dominicans. Okay, well, I, you know, I came into the church and I still wanted to be, because I'd been so active in that previous church, I wanted to be active in the Catholic church too. I wanted to do more than just come on Sundays and... Um, so the, the first thing I did was um, I started doing the children's liturgy of the word because I was bringing my two-year-old grandson to church with me and he wanted to go downstairs with the other kids and he was too little to go by himself. So I was taking him down and I started out helping and I ended up doing the children's liturgy of the word for a while. Then I became, I started doing, uh, I was a reader and um, I really liked that um, but I wanted I was still that was still involved just some days and I wanted to get involved in some other things tried to help with RCIA um, but that was a disaster because I really offended the people who were involved because I'm saying you're asking these people to put off becoming Catholic for a year you better give them a reason why because they can if they're just wanting to be christian they can go across they can go two blocks away and get baptized tomorrow you know 
and people didn't like that. <laughs> so nice. <laughs> that didn't work. Um, you know, this has got to be more than. It's got to be more than be nice and work for minimum wage. Um, work for the you know to to improve the minimum wage that's not you know that's not why we're catholics um so uh at that point um i read about a group or i may have heard about it on ewtn that was called catholics united for the faith so i started attending their meetings and i was really started out really enjoying the meetings, but they were, as the time went by, I began to realize these were some really angry people, and I wasn't angry. I was glad to be back at the church. There were things I disagreed with, but I was still glad I was not angry, so I stopped there, but through that group, I met a Carmelite couple. They were third order Carmelites. And they invited me to come to some of the meetings there. They but they're in Flint. And the Carmelites, that group of Carmelites anyway, were very, very strict. If you wanted to be part of them, you had to be at every meeting. I was a single parent. I was working nights. I worked every other weekend and I couldn't get to every week. I couldn't get to every meeting. So um, that didn't work. I met a Dominican and met with her a couple of times and she gave me some books to read and I went I started reading one of them and it was again um, all about how as we're we're cat we're 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 Catholics we should be working toward a living wage this is you know these are the important things they were it was all about social justice everything was social justice and I'm like, mm, yeah, um, I'm not big on social justice. You don't put a modifier in front of mercy. We don't put a modifier in front of charity. Why do we put a modifier? We don't put a modifier in front of hope. Why do we put a modifier in front of justice? Because we're not really talking about justice. If we were talking about justice, we wouldn't need a modifier. And I, so I just didn't pursue it at all. Instead, I went to try and become, I thought, oh, somebody suggested I do the lay, the lay ministry through the diocese. And I thought, okay, I can do that. And I applied and I did a year of that. And then my mom came down, was became really obvious that she had dementia. And my dad just couldn't keep up with her. Uh, what was what was happening? He didn't understand what was happening. And so I ended up dropping out. And it was a good thing I did because he, a few months after that, he died very suddenly, and I was um, left with caring for my mother. So. <clears throat> I cared for her until she died a few years later, and then I tried getting back into lay ministry. Um, and also, at that time, I connected back up with the Dominicans. And this time, they were being... Um, someone else had taken over, basically. And they were moving in a in a different direction, and so I I started um, I started into I was uh, received, and I started into formation with that. And at the same time, I was doing the lay ministry. I finished three years that time with the lay ministry because I started over, and um, and then I switched parishes, and the parish I switched to didn't have lay ministers, didn't support the lay ministry program. And so I was kind of out because I couldn't get the pastor to um, back me. 
So you, you have to have you have to have your 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 priest or or um, administrator parish administrator back you, and I didn't have that. So I dropped out, and it was actually a good thing. It let me to be able to concentrate on formation um, for the lay Dominicans. Um, in studying, in between the trying out the Carmelites and actually going into formation with the Dominicans, that was a number of years, and I did a lot of, of research on the various different third orders, and the Dominicans suit me. I like to study. I like to teach. Um, and uh, and truth has been important to me since I was a little kid. And veritas is one of the mottos. So I I find that it has been um, a good thing for me spiritually. It has helped me to grow a great deal in 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 the faith. So now I'm I'm um, fully promised, and um, quite involved. And I'm I'm really think that this this for for the time being is where I really belong. Very good. I'm very glad to hear. Now we've got several questions flowing in, so um, maybe aim for a minute response. Okay. Um, uh, first question is, uh, how was it with friends and family uh, when you told them that you were returning to the to the Catholic Church? Are they happy? Um, for the most part, yes. Um, family, family was fine parents were glad we were very glad that I was back into the church, my father in particular at this point my mother had been received into the church um, so they were they were glad that I was that I was back um, my friends the um, my closest friends didn't have a problem with it uh, some of the other ones that were more peripheral to me um, did, and it's, and so they're you know we're not in contact at all any longer. But for for most it, it worked. It was fine. It, it was fine. They accepted that I was being I was going where I where God was leading me. Very good. Now, um, this is a specific question. Earlier, you were talking about how sometimes Protestants would avoid certain passages, but when you were uh, involved in the Protestant Church and then um, later started studying, were there certain passages that you had not seen yourself? that and uh coming back into the church uh that those uh, those that you had the experience of i've never looked at it this way before oh lots of them um, I, I couldn't um, um the, the the high priestly prayer um in in the gospel of john uh he, how jesus um wanted us wants us want um, uh, another one from I think um, Timothy I think it's the letter Timothy um, the, the foundation the foundation of, of truth is the church that's the um, that one was just an eye opener when I saw that yeah, it's uh, 1 Timothy 3.15. It's talking about the household of God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. Yes. Yes. Um, because, because 
because the the that three three year program that I talked about, mm-hmm. his thing it was it was all based on four pillars, and it was scripture. That the, the scripture is the basis of truth. And wait a minute, what does scripture say is the basis of truth? Well, what scripture says is the basis of truth is the household of God, church. Which of course makes sense because it was the church that uh, composed the, yeah. the scripture, that uh, compiled scripture and comments upon scripture. Yes. But that one was a that one was a real eye opener for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it eye opener for a few people because I actually <clears throat> preached on it one Sunday. <laughs> and then, yeah, that was quite an eye opener. Which uh, brings us to our next question: um, Was it all difficult for you moving from a church where a woman could lead a sermon of some sort, uh, where only the priest gives a homily on Sunday? Um, not, not as difficult as I expected. Um, there are still opportunities to share and, and to teach. I did end up, I, I had, I said I had uh, tried RCA at one point. I did end up RCIA director at a later date. Um, and, and so I was able to I'm more of a teacher than a preacher anyway um, and I was able to do that just being able to talk about scripture to talk about God to talk about faith those are not limited it is only in the mass that women are not allowed Women can teach. Women can preach in other circumstances. Right. So when the you go to conferences, there are all kinds of women. It's it's only in the mass. Right. To me, that makes sense. It it it's the the priest is there in persona Christi, in the person of Christ, and. Yeah, so it makes sense to me anyway. Oh yeah, absolutely. I think sometimes um, there can be a misunderstanding when Paul talks about, you know, I do not uh, allow a woman to teach. She must remain quiet in church. That, um, that, you know, I don't allow any woman to have an authority over a man and take it in such an absolute sense that there were there were probably some Baptist churches out there where a woman literally can't even talk uh, when she enters into the church and has to wait till she gets home to ask her husband about what you know the sermon meant for that day. But the men and the women didn't sit together. The men and the women didn't sit together. They did. They didn't sit together in in the synagogue. The women were in a different spot than the men. Uh, there were many churches. There's there's a there's a church right in Bay County right now that it's an Apostolic Brethren church, and the women do not sit with the men. The women sit on one side of the church. The men sit on the other side of the church. If the woman's asking her husband. She's yelling across the church. <laughs> That's funny. To do it, you know, so they don't wait till you get home and ask. Don't yell across the church to ask him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so so we we don't always understand the the culture of things we're trying to interpret things without fully understanding the culture of the times and um and it, authority if you want to do an interesting word study look at that look up the greek uh, the di- various different words the various different greek words that are translated authority. Um, one of them means specifically to take the power for oneself, which is an entirely different kind of thing than, for instance, what the centurion said when he told Jesus, 
I am a man under authority. And I say this to this one, go, and he goes, and this one, come, and he comes. That's a different, that's an entirely different kind of thing from then taking the power for yourself. And so it's an interesting word study. If you ever get your strongs out and, and go and look at it, the strongs commentary, um, concordance and dictionary, it's a real interesting word study. Yeah, it's fascinating. I don't think I've uh, I heard either of those things. That's that's yep. fascinating. All right, we have another question here. Where do you see the church in twenty years? Uh, I I can tell you what I fear, and that is a schism. Do you really think it'll come to that? I don't know, and I pray not. But at some point, there's there's just got to be something that that gives. Um, there's got to be some acceptance of legitimate differences. Um, when when um, Traditionis Custodis came out, I thought, wow, if I was a Byzantine Catholic, I'd be really nervous right now. When when they're talking, tossing around things like there's only only the Novus Ordo is a valid thing. If I was Byzantine, I'd be nervous. Well, if I may, the, the, the language of uh, the Muta Proprio um, at first kind of makes it sound like that the, the Novus Ordo is the only expression of the Roman Rite, uh, the unique expression of the Roman Rite, but if you, you, you continue reading, it will say, and I don't know why he even has to say this, that the, the Novus Ordo is the um, unique expression of the Latin Rite, you know, uh, post-liturgical form. Right. Uh, reform. And, and how how certain are you that that's going to remain unchanged? That that word, the Latin Rite, um, the Latin Church, as opposed to the Eastern Catholic, that that the uh, that the overreach isn't going to continue. Well, that's interesting. Has there been any hints not, in your? Not, not right now, but it took a long time to go from from the Summa Pontificum to Traditionis Custodis. It took years. I don't know. I, I truly don't. I'm not I'm not prophesying anything. I'm not saying this is what I expect, but there is a lot of anger on the part of the people who are finding that their hopes and dreams and plans didn't work out the way they wanted. They look around, there's no young people in their churches. But they look at the Latin mass, and it's full. Young people, young families, big families. There's a lot of, I think there's a lot of people out there who are determined that their vision of the church is going to succeed. And... Even if it... Uh... It causes severe harm. And even if it causes schism, yeah. Which brings me to the next question, that is, uh, next Pope, are we looking at a Francis II or a Pius XIII? <laughs> or a Benedict XVII? Um, I, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Um, 
uh, the, the people that I thought would make wonderful popes are getting a little long in the tooth. Um, I love Robert Sarah. Uh, an African pope? I was hoping for him this time, last time around. Mm. A wonderful would be have an African pope and then have somebody who's actually um, you know uh, I, I can't say he's traditional but he's very very definitely um, orthodox Mao orthodox yeah I think for, for, for some they're only interested in diversity when the end goal of their progressivism is met. Otherwise, uh, just treated like everybody else. <laughs> that, that reminds me, many years ago, many years ago, my sister-in-law was attending the University of Michigan, and she was talking at, uh, at a family gathering about how wonderful all the diversity is at the University of Michigan. And I said to her, yes, I yes, that's absolutely wonderful. They have black Marxists and white Marxists and Hispanic Marxists and Asian Marxists and Marxists. All the diversity that you would ever want. Yep, all the diversity you'd ever want, yep. <laughs> oh, that's, that's incredibly funny. Yeah, that's good stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, all right, well, we've uh, gotten to the end of our questions, so I want to thank you for your time and sharing your story with us tonight. And uh, um, Yeah, did you have any uh, final words that you'd like to no, share? No, just thank you for the opportunity. This was quite enjoyable. Yeah, I, I enjoyed it very much myself. It was a very, very good talk. It's always it's always good to to think back at um, how we get where we are today. And uh, each time you look back, you see something a little different. Not only that, but I also have um, you know we're awfully we're often wondering exactly you know why we went through the things that we did, and um, and looking back we can see um, exactly what God ended up bringing out of it that gave shape to who we are today. Yes. You know, yes. Uh, yes. God can use a great deal amount of things to shape and mold us. So uh, even things that would be very unexpected. Yes. Exactly. So. Exactly. Well, thank you so much, Corey. I, I did really enjoy this. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you have a good night. And you too. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. All right, folks. Um, so that was Terry's co uh, conversion story. And uh, thanks for uh, the questions and for hanging out. Um, I'll probably have this up on YouTube in a couple of days. Uh, I like to wait a little bit for terms of service and partner agreement. But um, it will obviously, if you missed part of it, uh, it will be in my past broadcasts. Um, so uh, tomorrow we have another conversation lined up. You folks may enjoy this. Me and my friend Mitch are going to just sit and we're going to discuss theology. Mitch is a Protestant Calvinist, and I am, of course, a Roman Catholic. So I'm, I'm sure we may end up running into certain topics, um, which uh, the Mitch, yes, the Mitch, who knows, knows Mitch. He's going to be here tomorrow. Um, around the same time I try to aim for 8 p.m. 8 p.m. and uh, of course uh, we uh, uh, we we uh, 
Uh, we're both very long-winded and uh, can have very long conversations, so um, I'm not planning on forcing it into an hour, hour and a half kind of thing. <laughs> Mullinous noises. Well, you don't have to worry. You don't have to worry about that, you know. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I, I dabble in some Thomism, but, you know, I'm it's not like I don't have a soft spot for the Molinists since I came from a Wesleyan Arminian theological tradition. So, uh, but anyways, yeah, uh, 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. It's going to be me and the Mitch. We'll uh, be having just, we have nothing planned. It's all off the cuff. We're, we're just, um, I may start off with a few questions but I think what would be really neat if there's anybody here in chat tonight that if you could stop by tomorrow while we're live you are free to ask us any question you want ask the Calvinist ask the Catholic and uh, we'll just have fun with it so with that everybody have a blessed evening and uh, sleep well